voice and be glad in it. I hope I moved my microphone up. There we go. Uh, good, morning. good morning. It is good to be with you in worship today, whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining us on the live stream. We are glad that you have joined us. We'll begin, as we always do, with our gathering song, Welcome Everybody. <coughs> Hand motions, good to see you here. Um, please stand as you are able and join as we sing together. <coughs> country and for the first time ever we had a clean sweep we had first second and third in the p4 p5 and p6 races all firsts and we won the sheet there's two of the trophies are there for you to see if you want to pop up later and we won the shield in the middle now looking at the shield and all of the engraving on it third guruk had never won it before or certainly not 
in the time of that shield. So we were absolutely delighted to win it. Then on Sunday afternoon, I took a squad of four boys to Well Park McKirk for the Bible challenge based on the Good Samaritan and about being kind. Over two hours, the boys had to do anagrams, um, word searches, creating words. They had to do a YouTube short, so like a TikTok sketch, or something on being kind, a quick fire round, and design a card for Compassionate and Clyde, which is now with them in the boxes. And again, our team won the Bible Challenge Rose Bowl. So fantastic news for the boys and, and a fantastic weekend last weekend for Third Good. <laughs> last night we had another good weekend or another night and I'm going to actually invite Alan Warwick up because Alan is uh, the mastermind behind the quiz night so <laughs> let him tell you all about it. I, I don't have any trophies to show off, but just to give you a summary of last night, we had 120 people attending the quiz last night. It was actually a sellout. I think we had about 20 more people requesting tickets, but you just can't squeeze them into the golf club. So it was a great night, uh, a fun quiz, albeit a wee bit competitive. Uh, the charities, if you remember, the Boys Brigade got a third share. Dnipro Kids, which is a charity supporting Ukrainian kids, both in Ukraine and kids that have been brought to Scotland by Hibernian FC supporters. They, they built up a connection with them. Uh, so there's money going to go to that charity. And the third charity was Inverclyde Food Bank. And the manager of Inverclyde Food Bank, um, Adam uh, Wines was there last night and gave a small talk about all the good work they do in our community. So these were the three organisations that will benefit from the, from the sum raised. I'd like to thank anyone here or in the wider community who bought raffle tickets. I think we sold out our over 2,000 raffle tickets. Anyone who donated a raffle prize and of course anyone who came on uh, uh, along in the night. The support of this church and congregation, and I know we irritate you with announcements six weeks in advance, is superb, but this was our 10th year. And at the moment the sum raised was £2,059. So that will be split three ways between the BB, Dnipro Kids and Inverclyde Food Bank. Uh, so thanks very much to anyone who supported last night either in the run-up to it or actually in attendance. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Alan and Diane and everyone who's involved with the BB. That's a lot of wonderful things uh, to celebrate, indeed. Um, I guess another item to celebrate, uh, Jim has maybe <laughs> uh, updates about the Presbytery Mission Plan. <laughs> I'm not quite sure if it's a celebration, but never mind. Uh, on the last two Sundays, David has read Presbytery's citation to us as a congregation, informing us about and inviting us to attend, for our interest, a Presbytery meeting yesterday, at which the mission plan would be discussed and hopefully approved. And it was duly approved. <clears throat> this means that as and when either David or Terry Peterson at St John's retires or moves elsewhere, there will be a union between St John's and ourselves and the United Congregation will continue to be linked to St Ninian's in Latfield. There will then be one full-time minister serving the whole of Gourock and St Ninian's parish. I now need to draw your attention to the next bit. We have been made aware that there may have been some rumours circulating that St John's building will be closed. This is not what the plan says, and I would ask you to be clear about that. As David has said previously on a number of occasions, the place of Sunday worship will be in this building. In respect of the St John's building, the mission plan says, and I will quote, hopefully avoid confusion. The mission plan says this, given the lack of community space available, 
St John's will begin to explore the possibility of repurposing their suite of buildings to provide a community hub and worship centre that would offer expressions of worship beyond Sunday mornings, as well as offering other resources for the wider community. So that's, I hope that's quite clear. That St John's building will not be closing <clears throat> per the plan. The plan agreed by Presbytery yesterday now has to be agreed centrally by the Church of Scotland. Excuse me. <clears throat> and if it, <clears throat> if it is agreed, <clears throat> excuse me, returned to Presbytery for final approval. So, if anyone tells you that St John's is to close, please reply that that is not Presbytery's plan. Thank you. Thank you for that update, Jim. I believe that is all the intimations at this point. Does anybody have any good news to share this morning? Scotland be Italy. <laughs> good news. Well, in the future, any good news can be shared with David or I as you come into the church. I should have mentioned earlier, David is leading the service at St. Ninian's this morning, which is why it's just me today. Um, and uh, as always, any future intimations uh, can be emailed to the address um, news at ogachurch.org.uk by noon on Thursdays to be included in the weekly update. And now let us turn our hearts and minds to the worship of God. Our first hymn is number 194, This is the Day. Please rise if you are able and join as we sing together. <laughs> Do you know who loves you the very, very most? 
Okay, so do you know what that says? G-O-D, God, because we're in church. That's usually the, usually the right answer. <laughs> Whenever I ask you, you can just say God or Jesus, and you'll probably be right. But I think I showed you this book before, but I really like it, and I think it's a good one, because it talks to us about what God is like and shows us some of the ways that God loves us. So have you ever wondered what God is like? Yeah, we talk about God a lot, but we don't always know what God is is like and that's a question that people have asked for a very long time so i'll show you the pictures but you can also come up and see the book later because it's really pretty but it says all these different things that god is like so that so god is like the stars forever present and bright even when they feel far away you can always look up and see them winking at you right because god is always with you because god loves you so much god is like a fort have you ever built a fort Yes, that's always fun to do, but that's kind of what God is like. I found a big fort. A big fort? Awesome. But God is strong and secure with walls that are mighty and safe and keep you safe. God is like a gardener, patient and nurturing. Have you ever planted flowers or tried to make anything grow? Yeah? It's not easy, but it's fun to do, and that's how God loves you. And also, God is like a mother. Like a mummy, strong and safe, you can crawl up into her lap whenever you want to, and she will hold you until you fall asleep. Do you ever snuggle with your mom? Yes. I do. Yes. <laughs> Cuddles are always important. So today on Mother's Day, when we remember how much we love our moms and how much our moms love us, we also think about all the people that we love in our lives and also how much God loves us. So I thought that we could say a prayer together. Oh, yeah, that's because moms are so great, right? They tell you how much they love you, and they show you that. So what are some ways that you could show some love today? Hmm. Would you be kind to someone? Yeah. Yeah? Have you showed your mommies how much you love them today? I love them so much. So much. Maybe, <laughs> did you give them a big cuddle? No. Yeah, that's really good. Make them a card. Make them a card? That's a great way to show up. I see some cuddles happening there. That's great. Well, we'll go ahead and say a prayer together before you head to Young Church. So I'll say the words, and then you can repeat after me, okay? Sound good? All right, let's pray together. Dear God, Dear God. Thank, you thank you for all the love in our lives, for all the, love in our lives. <laughs> for all the ways you love us, for all the ways you love us. And all the ways you show us. And all the ways you show us. How to love others. How to love others. Amen. Amen. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's so good to see you today. I'll invite all of you to rise as you are able as we sing our next hymn together. It's number 181, For the Beauty of the Earth.
and Sylvia has our reading. It's John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Jesus heals a blind man. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spat in the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Amen. Let us pray together. Everlasting God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you have made us in your image, and you call us just as we are, that we would come and worship you together in your name as your children. And in order that we, your children, would know your love, you sent your Son to be the light of the world. As Christ shines upon us, may we learn what pleases you and live in all truth and goodness. God of perfect love, you continually bring forth life, transforming sadness to joy and despair to hope. Transform our hearts, O Lord, that we would turn away from sin and toward you, that we would seek and know your will, and in your service find perfect freedom. We are grateful, God, for your leading and guiding. You don't leave us where we are, but you invite us to speak out truth, strive for peace, fight for justice, and work for healing. Remind us that you are with us in these and all things, that we would be equipped to participate in your holy work in the world. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever, and who taught us to pray as together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we'll pick up with our story from John's Gospel again in chapter 9, beginning at verse 13. The, Phar the Pharisees investigate the healing. <coughs> they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud in my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened, the man replied. He is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind, 
and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, and how he can see now, or who, or who opened his eyes. We don't know, ask him. He is of age, he'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. And that is why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a, bo a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could, no he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And he threw them out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? <coughs> Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who will become blind, those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Amen. Thanks be to God for these readings of his holy word, and to his name be all the praise and the glory. Thank you so much. Please rise as you are able and join as we sing our next hymn, number 348, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness.
in youth ministry. So with wonderful staff and volunteers, I spent a lot of my time planning weekly youth group events and summer mission trips and overnight walk-ins at the church. And a lot went into making sure these programs went smoothly from sending out emails and getting RSVPs to making sure we had all the supplies we needed, especially enough food. That was always critical. Uh, but I'll say we hardly ever had the right amount of food. It was either too much or too little. But I spent so much time planning that when we got to the actual event or trip, I was still in that mode where I was constantly getting ready for the next activity or counting heads to make sure we didn't leave anyone at a gas station or reminding everyone of the rules so that they didn't break anything or break each other. I would be so consumed with the management of the situation, which was important, but I wasn't always present. And so sometimes I missed out on the jokes that were shared and the joy that was being had. And I think we've all maybe experienced this, whether you're hosting a party and you spend most of your time in the kitchen making sure everyone else has enough food to eat, that you don't actually get to sit and talk with any of your guests, or you're so wrapped up in the details of a project or plan that you miss getting to enjoy seeing it come to fruition. Perhaps you remember the story of Mary and Martha in Luke's Gospel. Jesus came to visit the sisters at their home, and while Martha was distracted by all the preparations that were necessary, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and listened to him talk. I bet you can guess that I have always resonated with Martha in this story. But Martha went to Jesus to complain about her sister who left her to do all the work by herself. And Jesus told her that she was worried and upset about many things, but really only one thing was needed, and Mary had chosen the better option, which was to sit and be present. And it's not that what Martha was doing was wrong or unimportant. Just as so many of the things that distract us or draw our attention are not wrong or unimportant. After all, someone needs to make sure there is food to eat and that plans are in place and preparations are made. It's just that sometimes we let those things consume us so that we miss the bigger picture. And sometimes we do find ourselves getting bogged down in issues that could be deemed inconsequential, and then we dismiss the point entirely. Our story from John's Gospel today shows us several examples of this. From the disciples to the Pharisees to the very parents and neighbors of this man who received his sight from Jesus, there is so much focus on everything else but the gracious work of God happening in their midst. Jesus and his disciples were walking along when they came across the man who had been born blind, whose name we unfortunately never learn. And the disciples were the first characters to get sidetracked from Jesus' ministry and mission. Immediately, they wanted to know the cause of the man's blindness, and in their view, there were only two options, either his own sin or the sin of his parents. But Jesus was quick to reject the idea that disability or illness is a punishment for sin, a toxic theology that unfortunately continues to circulate in churches even today. But Jesus rejected that notion, and after calling himself the light of the world, he proceeded to make mud by spitting on the ground and then putting it on the man's eyes. Jesus told him to go wash in a specific pool, and after the man did that, he came back able to see. And I think it's important to note that when we come across healing stories in the Bible, we might get fixated on trying to figure out what really happened or how to understand the miracles in light of all we now know about science and medicine. We might also wonder why we have not seen the kind of healing we have prayed for 
in our own lives or in the lives of our loved ones, and those questions are more than valid. But I think what these kinds of stories do is help us better understand who Jesus is and know more deeply what Jesus is about. In all of these healing stories, there is more than just physical healing taking place. There's also change in one's spiritual and social situation. Because healing is about renewing whole communities and restoring individuals to those communities from which they have been marginalized. So while here's a point in the story where we, as modern day readers, could go down a rabbit hole of our own by trying to understand or explain this miraculous healing, I believe that rather than try to make sense of the miracle, it's more helpful to view it as the turning point in the plot and what it signifies about Jesus and the grace that he extends. So we'll be focusing our attention on all that comes after the man gains his sight, because we still have the entire rest of the story to go. And it's the neighbors who next miss what Jesus had done and was doing in his ministry. Instead of being amazed that a man they had known his whole life was finally able to see for the first time, they didn't even recognize him. They weren't sure it was really him, as if they had never seen him beyond his blindness, which they used to define him. Some of them wouldn't even listen to him when he insisted on the truth, that he was in fact the same man and that he had been healed. They were so skeptical of his story that they took him to the Pharisees so they could investigate what really happened. And the Pharisees, of course, are just as skeptical of the man's story. Some of them said that Jesus couldn't possibly be from God because he performed this so-called healing on the Sabbath, and it was forbidden to work on that day. Others said that he had to be from God because a sinner wouldn't have been able to perform such a sign. They were so divided that they turned again to the man who said that Jesus was a prophet. They even sent for the man's parents to confirm that he had been born blind and asked them how he was now able to see. But his parents were afraid about their own place in their community if they were believed to be following Jesus, so they left their son to speak for himself. And again and again the man told the truth about how he was healed, but the Pharisees ended up driving him out. They couldn't get past their own beliefs that didn't allow for a man like Jesus to perform a miracle on the Sabbath. They were so wrapped up in who was allowed to define sin and offer grace. Who was right and who was wrong. Who was in charge and who had to follow the rules. In all of the conversation and deliberation and aftermath of the healing, every person in this story with the exceptions of Jesus and the man he healed, missed the miracle of that healing. Like the woman at the well in last week's passage from John, who gradually came to know that Jesus was the Messiah, the man who was healed in this story grew in his understanding of Jesus, eventually confessing belief in Jesus as Lord after Jesus had sought him out and worshiping him. But everyone else was distracted by their own concerns about the things that didn't actually matter. And they missed the work of love and grace and healing and reconciliation that God was doing among them. At the very end of the passage, Jesus declared, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. That's not in the literal sense of sight, but in the metaphorical sense of understanding who Jesus is as the revealer of truth. This caused the Pharisees to ask him, surely we are not blind, are we? Which just highlighted again that they were oblivious to what Jesus really meant. They completely missed who Jesus was and what his ministry was about. Their distraction meant that they didn't understand or receive the good news 
that Jesus came to share, the grace he came to extend, not just for the man who was healed, but for everyone, including them. You might know that this passage from John was the inspiration for the hymn that we'll sing in just a few minutes, which is a familiar one, I think. And I'm sure Callum can correct me if I get any of this information wrong. But Amazing Grace was written by John Newton, an English sailor who became the captain of a slave ship in the 18th century. His mother had died when he was young, and he pretty much left behind the Christian religion that she had instilled in him. But he started to find his faith again when he found himself near death on a ship in the middle of the sea during a terrible storm, as we all might. He left the slave trade only because of poor health, and eventually he became an ordained minister in the Church of England. And as his faith increased, so too did his remorse over his involvement in the slave trade. He eventually became an abolitionist and testified against slavery at parliamentary hearings. <coughs> he wrote Amazing Grace to illustrate a sermon on New Year's Day, 1773, and it appears to be a kind of spiritual autobiography, describing Newton's coming to faith again, his wonder at God's grace at work in his life, the things he gradually came to see and understand as his focus shifted to a more just and faithful way of living. You surely have a lot of things in your life that keep your mind occupied, whether they be serious situations that do demand a lot of your time and energy, or maybe even some of those more minor details that are somewhat inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. And it's important to make that decision, to discern for yourself what is really important and what is simply distracting you from the bigger picture. But whenever your attention is drawn so strongly in one direction, you might miss some of the other things happening around you, the ways that God might be offering grace in your life, the work God might be doing in your midst. So it's probably a good idea to stop every now and then, to pray or reflect or just observe, to see what you notice. I think that churches are especially susceptible to getting bogged down in various concerns that may or may not be what God is really calling us to. So please don't talk about churches in general, not this church in particular. But when we as church people get caught up in maintaining the building and keeping up with the budget and making sure there are enough volunteers, which are all necessary and important things, hopefully we also take time to be present in worship, to sing and listen to the music, to pray and hear what God is saying to us today to build relationships with our neighbors over tea and coffee, to see what God is doing here in this place, what grace is being shown forth among us, and how we get to witness and participate in it. And thanks be to God for that amazing gift of grace in all of our lives. Amen. Will you please rise and join together as we sing our next hymn, number 555, Amazing Grace. <laughs>
recently passed away. She formerly lived on Caledonia Crescent and had recently entered care at Glenfield Care Home. Her <coughs> funeral will take place at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, the 12th of April at the crematorium. So we keep May's family in our hearts and prayers as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Great God, in you is more love than we can imagine and more grace than we can fathom. You have shown yourself in Jesus Christ as a God who meets us where we are and loves us as we are. We are glad for this day and grateful for your many gifts. You bring good things into our lives more than we can name, more than we can number. You give us the bread of life sustaining our souls and feeding our deepest hungers. You accompany us on our way, and we thank you for your abundant faithfulness. Our hearts are full with many things today. On this Mother's Day, we especially give thanks for all the women in our lives who have shaped us and loved us well. And we pray for those for whom this day, for, work, for whatever reason, is a hard day. May it land gently, and may you surround all those in need of your presence with your love. O oh God, your world is full of beauty and also brokenness. Disease and death and pain and sorrow are constantly among us. The journey through these days is marked by uncertainty and heartache, and we are frequently overwhelmed by the needs around us and within us. Some need healing, some need encouragement, some need comfort or assurance. We all need hope. So we turn to you asking you to hear our prayers and grant what we need for the living of these days. And we pause for a moment of quiet to remember those people and situations that are especially close to our hearts. O oh Lord, we pray for our country and for all countries. We pray for an end to war and violence and suffering, for renewed commitments to our common life. Refresh in us the values of your heart, justice, righteousness, compassion, mercy, and peace. Help us to find a unity of purpose as citizens and neighbors. We pray for your church, O oh God, in places near and far. May the waters of your grace continually refresh and empower us to extend the love of Jesus to all people. We pray for our congregation, for our life together, and for our efforts to follow in the ways of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn is, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing after which we'll have the benediction and then the sung blessing, and then all are invited to join in the hall for tea and coffee fellowship. <coughs> so please rise as you are able as we sing our final hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
And as you do, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Thank you.